want to welcome you to our prayer meeting. Glad you're able to participate in this midweek reflection with the Lord. Let me begin with a word of prayer. Lord, we come before your presence asking you to guide us in prayer. Help us to grow in our prayer life and our desire to pray. We thank you for the invitation to do it, for the opportunity to enter into time like this. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, one, a couple of prayer requests I would share is that uh, continue to remember the Hancock family and as Peggy Hancock passed away, the funeral is this Friday morning at 11 a.m. At 10 o'clock is visitation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the service is 11 a.m. here at the church. I want to pray for Nailene Nauman as she anticipates and is getting ready for surgery. She's in the hospital in the Sugar Land area. So I want to pray for her that the surgery would go well and would bring healing into her life. And of course, others in our circle of the church family, of our families, people we know, we want to lift them up. I, I, for some reason I've been drawn to this verse I read it Sunday at the end of the service. I want to look at verse 21 of Hebrews 13 as I read something this evening about spiritual discipline and spiritual health. Hebrews 13, 20, 20 and 21 says, Now may the God of peace Verse 21, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. That verse is just jam-packed with direct, obvious, spiritual teaching that we would be complete in every good work to do his will we want to do his will working in us what is well pleasing in his sight so i would remind you that you want to conduct yourself that you're well pleasing in his sight that you would honor him and when you do that you're going to bless people you're going to be an effective servant of the Lord. Dallas Willard, one of his books, talks about the spiritual disciplines. And he talks about how you cultivate those disciplines, those, that fruit of the Spirit. He says this, We should not only want to be merciful, kind, unassuming, and patient persons, but also be making plans to become so. We are to find out, that is, what prevents and what promotes mercifulness and kindness and patience in our souls. And we are to remove hindrances to them as much as possible, carefully substituting that which assists Christ-likeness. Many well-meaning people cannot succeed in being kind because they're too rushed to get things done. Notice that. Too rushed. They're rushing to get things done. Haste has worry, fear, and anger as close associates. It is a deadly enemy of kindness and hence of love. If this is our problem, 
We may be greatly helped by a day's retreat into solitude and silence, where we will discover that the world survives even though we are inactive. There we might prayerfully meditate to see clearly the damage done by our unkindness and honestly compare it to what, if anything, is really gained by our hurry. We will come to understand for the most part our hurry is really based upon pride, self-importance, fear, lack of faith, rarely upon the production of anything of true value for anyone. Perhaps we will end up making plans to pray daily for the people with whom we deal regularly. We may resolve to ask associates for forgiveness for past injuries. Whatever comes of such prayerful reflection, we may be absolutely sure that our lives will never be the same and that we will enjoy a far greater richness of God's reality in our lives. The single most obvious trait of those who profess Christ but do not grow into Christ's likeness is their refusal to take the reasonable and time-tested measures for spiritual growth. Now listen to that. I close with that. Dallas Willard, a great devotional writer of our time, he recently died, but of our time, he says there are reasonable and time-tested measures for spiritual growth. Do we employ those or do we ignore those? And then also in this page, he talked about hurry, rushing, is probably the number one enemy of our spiritual health and discipline. Let's pray. Father, we talk so much, and I know as preachers, we preach so many things and recommendations, and we address so many topics, and we try to answer so many questions. But Father, as I read this page, and I reflect on hurry and reasonable time-tested paths of spiritual growth, I'm reminded that our personal, inward, spiritual health is our responsibility. It's our lifeline to you. It's our privilege to enjoy. So Father, I pray that the First Baptist family would be still and know that you are God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good evening. Uh, as we continue on in our time of, of looking at the scripture and praying through it, uh, praying for needs uh, that are in our community and our church family, um, I wanted to uh, share something that I think I've shared before in John chapter uh, 13, and, but it's in, in light of Brother Mike's uh, message this past Sunday, and then as he continues on to talk about what it is uh, to make disciples, uh, there's a big question uh, in my heart for me is whether or not we are disciples. It's one of those phrases that, that gets used, yes, I am a disciple of Christ, but for many that's that they pull back and say, uh, no, I'm a, I'm a follower, I'm a believer. I use those same terms as well. And yet, um, what we're called to be are Christ's disciples, learners and followers, but, but we bear the image of God and the image of Christ, that we are uh, you know, called to be changed, we are called new, and we are called to look differently than who we were. If we are truly his disciples, we are making disciples, but we're also... Um, 
we look like him. We have, like in Philippians uh, chapter 2, we have the attitude in us, which is also in Christ Jesus. We are changed into his likeness. Um, and one of the things that, that Jesus says is, is what that looks like, just one aspect of what that looks like. And it's a new commandment. You know, we, we talk about the Ten Commandments, all the other commandments, and what is the greatest commandment. Jesus was quizzed on that, and he turned it back on, on a, uh, a lawyer or a, uh, a, an expert in the law and said, well, what is, what's written? And he says uh, that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that you should, and you ask what the second one is, and he says that you should love your neighbor as yourself. And, and Jesus says, um, you have spoken rightly. This is correct. Um, and then Jesus adds in this other commandment that we overlook or we kind of lump in with loving your neighbor as yourself. But this is John 13. It says, when he had gone out, and this is Judas, um, after Jesus had said, one of you is going to betray me, and Judas leaves, um, hopefully everybody in that room realized what was going on. He says, when he had gone out, Jesus said, now is the son of man glorified. And God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him to himself and glorify him at once. And so Jesus says, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of glorification going on there. Um, but, but Jesus is coming to the end where he will ascend to the Father, that he will uh, achieve the glory, not achieve, but he will receive the glory that God has given him. That he will be raised from the dead. He will ascend and be at the right hand of God. Um, and God will be glorified because Jesus has done everything in revealing the Father that he was intended to do. He says, little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so also I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. And then he adds this. He says, a new commandment, um, not loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, although that is of utmost importance, not loving your neighbor as yourself, which is also important because all the law and the prophets hang on this, but Jesus speaks a new commandment uh, to, to, to his followers, to his disciples. He says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. I mean, this is a really strong statement. You have to think about uh, the picture of who's in the room. Um, You have people from all different backgrounds, all different walks of life, and yes, they have walked together. They have grown in in brotherhood, in uh, family. they're, They're there. They're together. And yet Jesus is commanding them that they would love one another because what's about to happen? He's leaving. And yet they're still going to have to walk forward together so that the world can see that they truly are his disciples. Um, as I think about that for myself today, um, you know, we have love your neighbor as yourself and that, he says, who is your neighbor? Um, you know, they question Jesus and he tells the story of the Good Samaritan and the neighbor is the one who... Um, who helps and, and who's there. Uh, you're supposed to love your neighbor, uh, but, or the one who helps is really the neighbor, the, the Samaritan who does things. It's not just people who look like you, who are around you, um, but it's everyone. And so when he says love your neighbor, I, I look out and say, oh yeah, I love everybody. Uh, and there's that, that phrase, I, I love everyone, but there's some people I just don't like. Well, I don't know if that, if that's permissible, um, but we look at the world and say, God loved the world, so I am to love those people in the world as well. Um, But this is a different commandment. This is a new one, that if we are to be disciples of Jesus, that we are to love other disciples of Jesus. So our petty conflicts, those things that we hold on to, those um, offenses, those ways that someone has hurt my feelings, yeah, I should probably let them know that it hurt my feelings so it doesn't keep happening. But if I allow that to fester, to grow, if I allow that to, to build up a wall between me and a brother or sister in Christ, then I'm not loving, loving others. I'm not loving one another. I'm not loving other disciples because we are called together in one identity and unity before the Father. For we are all his children. We are all his workmanship. We are co-heirs with Christ. We are 
we are all identified as his righteousness, as his ambassadors. We are identified as a holy priesthood. We have been put under the name of Christ. And so for us, division, um, jealousy, being offended, we, we just can't hold to it. Jesus commanded us to love God, and we said, that's great, I'm going to do that. Although I don't know that anyone does that all that well. I know a few people. Uh, we're commanded to love our neighbor as ourselves, and that starts off with how I love myself and, and then how I love others around me. But this is a new thing that Jesus spoke love one another. Those within the faith, those who claim to be followers of Jesus. Um, I'm not to, to hate, to have anger towards them, to discount them, um, to condescend to them, to assume that God cannot use them, um, to think that I'm better than them or that I'm lower than them. Um, I'm to love them with the love. It says, as I have loved you, as Jesus loved these disciples, um, that he gave his life for them, that he walked with them, that he engaged with them and revealed the Father to them, so am I to do the same. It's, it's a call into a life of community with others. It's a call into a life of love and walking with others who, who have the same identity. It's a, it's a call to not be offended by those people. It's a call to uh, not uh, assume and start out from a place of opposition. Um, I think about some people who have different belief systems than I do who claim to be a follower of Christ. And those beliefs could be uh, as little as what kind of music that we prefer. It's not really a belief, it's just an opinion or preference. Uh, when we talk about people who claim to follow Christ, um, who have fruit that is apparent, and yet the way they engage is a little bit different than I am, than I do. Uh, I tend to walk in opposition there just immediately, and yet Christ calls me to love them, to love them well, so that the world can see that we are united in him. Because uh, as God says, at just the right time, he is going to bring everything and use us to do it, to bring everything under submission and under the authority of Christ. My heart is, is often angry and frustrated with my brothers and sisters in Christ. It says more about me than it does them. Um, and if I am to be known as his disciple, I cannot let those things rule me. Yeah, let's pray. Father, God, I ask for forgiveness where my heart is embittered towards others. God, where I harbor um, anger, where I harbor uh, frustration and let it build into something more against my, my family and you. God, I pray for relationships um, that I have, where I have, instead of embracing uh, someone else um, because they are yours, um, instead I have held to, to petty differences or I've um, wanted to be offended by them. I've been annoyed. I've really set up on my high seat and look down upon so many people. And instead of engaging in a relationship with them and walking in fellowship in you, um, instead I've kept them at a distance. I've been cold. I've been dismissive. Father, I ask for your forgiveness. As we look in this church family, families are rough. Families sometimes have disagreements, but but we're all identified the same. Um, we are unified in that. And, and this church family, we're unified in you. So Father, I, I ask that you would help us to, to walk in unity, to love one another as you have loved us, forgiving everything. Father, I ask that, uh, uh, well, and having joy. God, I ask that you would help us look at our community and those other people who claim to be your followers. God, may we not stand in opposition to them, but instead, God, be united and love, love them well and be united in you, identified as yours. God, I ask that your spirit would move in our hearts and convict us where we have held on to um, 
these feelings that are less than love. Yeah, that your spirit would move us to repentance and that our lives would reflect um, love for one another so that the world will know that we are yours and the world will be drawn to you to glorify you. Father, we love you. Help us to love you more. Help us to love our community more. And help us to love one another more. We ask these things in that powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen.